Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout, where we are celebrating amazing women in science and exploration today. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host today. And we are joined from Mozambique by Anna Flam. So it's my pleasure to introduce her now. Uh, Anna grew up swimming and sailing in the Northeast US, which instilled a passion for our oceans. Um, she joined the Marine Megafauna Foundation in September of 2014, and she's based in Mozambique, managing the year-round manta research program. She also runs seasonal programs in Thailand and uh, Myanmar. Um, she's also the coordinator for mantamatch.org, which is a really cool online database of manta rays, um, letting researchers identify them by their patterns uh, in different locations uh, from their photos. So I know she's probably going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, Anna, it's so good to have you joining us today. Great, thanks. It's good to be here. Um, so I'll just get started. I'm going to share my screen because I've got some Manta photos and things that make all of this a bit more exciting. So, all right. so when is that do, working? When you do click the share screen, make sure you pick the first option to share your whole okay. desktop. That usually works the best. Okay. Let's try this. Yeah. Uh, Okay, um, so let me know if you can see. The there we go. Yeah. There? Okay. Good. Yeah, so um, as Joe said, I study mantas, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about the work I do uh, and how our research feeds into manta conservation and also how a lot of you guys can get involved as well. So, first off, where do I work? Um, I study mantas, and mantas are all around the world, especially in tropical to subtropical water. So you can find them pretty much all across the middle of the globe. Uh, right now, as Joe said, I'm in Mozambique, which is on the coast of southeastern Africa, uh, just north of South Africa. And I get to be based here year-round, because we actually have a year-round population of two different species of mantas. So that's unusual. You don't always see mantas staying in the same spot year round, but it makes it convenient because I get to live here. And then the other place where I work is in Thailand and Myanmar. And I'm going to be heading there at the end of the month to study the giant mantas over there. They're only there for a few months out of the year. So I'll be there for about two months this year looking for those guys. So mantas, in case you guys are not familiar with them, are a member of the shark and ray family. So they are a ray. They're actually the largest ray that has ever lived. And I'm sure most of you, when you think of rays, you're probably thinking of stingrays like this guy. Um, and mantas did evolve from stingrays, but they're very, very different from stingrays these days. Um, most of you, when you think of stingrays, you're obviously going to think of that stinging barb they have at the base of their tail that they use for defense. Um, mantas actually have lost that barb. They don't have any natural defense like barbs or teeth or anything like that at all. So although they're really large, they're actually pretty defenseless. Uh, if anything comes after them, all they're really gonna do is swim away very quickly. So as I said, they're big. They are the biggest ray in the ocean and they're actually the biggest ray that has ever lived. They grow up to eight meters across or 24 feet from fin tip to fin tip. Uh, it's the largest they get, but it's really impressive. Uh, if you guys are having trouble getting a handle on how big that is, um, not sure exactly how tall you all are, but if you were to think maybe four or five of you all lined up, um, that would be about the size of a big full grown manta ray. So mantas, despite their large size, eat really tiny animals called plankton. Uh, plankton, you can see there's a couple different species um, here. They really can be anything that's small, less than about an inch to a centimeter in size, and they are just anything that floats around with ocean currents. They just go where the current takes them and don't swim against it at all. So it can be gastropods like this, small little shrimps and crabs, or even fish eggs. Uh, this manta you see here is actually feeding right now. She's got her mouth open and she's just swimming through the water. All those little things you see in the water, all those specks, those are different plankton. And she just goes and filters the water through her mouth. And then an organ called gill rakers will filter and sieve that plankton out of the water so she can swallow it. 
Mantas are also possibly one of the most intelligent fish out there. Um, so this is sort of one of those things we're just starting to study and learn more about them. But mantas have the largest brain of any fish. And not only is their brain large because they're large, but they actually have the largest brain to body size ratio of any marine fish out there. And that ratio is important. Uh, that ratio has been shown in a lot of other species like us, like humans, like dogs and dolphins to be correlated with intelligence. So smarter animals tend to have bigger brain to body size ratio. So we think that mantas are one of the smartest fish you're gonna see out there. Unfortunately, they're also quite a threatened animal. So they're big and they reproduce really slowly. Uh, one manta is gonna have one pup every three to five years. And this is a fishery in Indonesia. It actually doesn't exist anymore, but this used to be a daily catch. And when your females are only having one pup every third or fifth year, they actually, they can't be fished like that. Uh, the population will just collapse very, very quickly. It's completely unsustainable. These mantas uh, were actually not being fished for food. Um, they're not something that people tend to eat. Their meat apparently tastes quite foul. Um, but people are fishing them because there's quite a market for their gill rakers, those organs they use to filter the plankton out of the water. Um, they'll sell them for Chinese traditional medicine. And they're marketed as a cancer cure. There is, I just want to make this really clear, zero scientific evidence to show that manta gill rakers are of any use at all as a cancer cure. So, or any type of a health remedy at all, actually. Uh, they're very toxic. So it's really unhealthy to be eating them. But people pay a lot of money for it. So unfortunately, the market is there and uh, people will spend the money on that. So when we're going out and we want to learn more about mantas, uh, we want to learn about them first off because we really like them. We think they're incredible creatures. And also because if we learn more about them, we'll know how to protect them better and help countries manage their manta populations. So one of the main things we do when we're out studying mantas is we take photo IDs of them. So you can see the photo on the left there. That's my boss taking a photo of a manta's belly. And on every manta's belly, you'll see they have this spot pattern. You can see the photos on the right-hand side showing the spot patterns. And those patterns are unique to every individual manta ray. They're like a fingerprint. So when we take these photos, we can learn which manta we're seeing, and we can learn about that individual. We can learn how they're growing over time. We can see where they're moving to different points in an area. And we can also learn about the whole manta population. So we can learn about how big the population is. We can learn how many males, how many females, how old the different mantas are. And we can also see how the population is changing over the time, whether the population is getting larger or whether the populations are shrinking. Um, this is how we've learned that manta populations are declining many parts of the world and how we know they're threatened and we actually need to start doing more to protect them so they don't go extinct. Another thing we can actually get with photography, if you look at the photo on the bottom right hand side, you'll see there's two little laser dots on the manta there. Those laser dots, they're from lasers. Uh, we have this rig that we use uh, that has two lasers that are 50 centimeters apart from each other, and we attach them to our camera. So what it means is every time we take a photo of a manta, there's this 50 centimeter size bar built in on the manta's photo. So uh, we can actually get very accurate measurements of how large the manta is and see how they grow over time. Uh, it's really great because it's a very non-invasive way of studying mantas. Uh, we don't have to hurt them or take them out of the water to really learn about them. We can just do it in their natural environment. The other great thing about studying mantas using photography is that you don't have to be a marine biologist to take a photo of a manta. Any of you guys can do it. Uh, you just need to be able to get in the water with a manta and a camera and get a photo of their belly. So it's really important for us because I can't be out finding every manta every day. I mean, even in the small town I live in here, we can have six dive boats going out in a single morning and I can't be on all of those. So it's really helpful for me when other divers can help me by taking photos of those mantas. And so anyone who gets a photo of a manta belly can actually contribute 
to a global database of manta rays. And those photos will be used for research by whatever scientist is in that area. So this website that we use, the one that I manage, Manta Matcher, it's mantamatcher.org. And if you go to it, our front page looks like this. And you can see there's a button here and another one here where you can report an encounter. Tell us about when you saw a manta. These buttons, they take you to our submission page. And all you need to do is upload a photo or a video that shows a manta's belly and tell us when and where you saw that manta. You can also tell us your name and email. And this is great because when you give us your email, we can tell you about the manta you saw. So you can learn more about whatever manta you were swimming with. Uh, maybe it's been named by someone else in the past, see where it's gone before, and get updates if people see this manta again in the future. Uh, once you guys have filled in all that information, you would send this encounter report, and any researcher working in an area then starts to get lots of email notifications like this that lets us know people are sending in manta photos. So these notifications mean I go to the website, and I check that all the information is correct, and I can run this algorithm that matches the manta spot patterns. It's basically like facial recognition, but for manta bellies. So I can see which manta was seen. And this is really helpful because when I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manta photos out there, um, trying to manually sort through all of them myself and figure out which manta was seen can be really difficult. So having an algorithm that speeds up the process like this is really incredible. So I'm just going to tell you guys a quick story about one of the mantas we've learned a lot about using Manta Matcher. So this is Wallop. Wallop is a male reef manta, and he lives in Indonesia. He's actually studied by several different researchers. You can see he's got a few different names under there, depending on who's been studying him. Uh, Wallop is in an area where we actually have two different study sites going on. One is in Komodo, which is a protected area. The other one is in Nusa Penida, which is also a protected area. So mantas and all fish are protected from fishing and other destructive activities. In between that, you've got this 450 kilometer space. So that's a pretty big distance, and that distance is a fishing zone. So there are lots of people fishing for mantas, but also for smaller things. So there's nets and all sorts of stuff that mantas can get tangled in. And so when we started doing research in this area, um, we had researchers collecting some photos, uh, but as Manta Matcher came out, we started to get lots more photos coming in from divers uh, who were going out and taking photos of the mantas out there and sending them to the website. It also made it a lot easier for the two researchers in Komodo and the one in Nusa Penida to compare the photos they were getting. And what they saw was that Wallop, who was first photographed in Nusa Penida in 2012, he was moving back and forth between the two spots. So someone photographed him in 2012 in Nusa Penida. Then in 2013, he showed up in Komodo, stuck around there through 2014, and then moved back down to Nusa Penida stayed there for a little bit, and the last time we saw him was 2015 in Komodo. So Wallop and a couple other mantas, who we've actually started calling the jet setters, um, they were moving back and forth between these two protected areas and going right through the middle of this fishing area. And this is important information for us to have as researchers because what it's showing is that these protected areas they're maybe protecting some of the fish in the area, but they're not protecting the mantas because the mantas are going right through this fishing area. And you can see this photo of Wallop on the top. He actually has a little bit of fishing gear that's gotten caught on his cephalic fin there. Uh, so they clearly are having run-ins with fishermen as they go between these two protected areas. So I'm just gonna walk you through what actually happened when we learned this, um, take you step by step. So first off, you guys, any of our citizen scientists or our marine biologists can be out there. You take a photo of a manta, and then you go, you upload those ID photos to mantamatcher.org. Once those photos are on mantamatcher.org, uh, it means we can study those mantas, and we find the migration. That migration between Komodo and Nusa Penida that Wallop was doing every couple of months or years, and several other mantas were doing this as well. 
So once we learned about this migration, um, we didn't want to just learn about it. We actually wanted to do something to help protect these mantas that were going through the fishing zone. So we took this information to the Indonesian government and it was fantastic because the government actually reacted and went, well, this is a problem. So they actually declared all Indonesians ter Indonesia's territorial waters, they made them a manta sanctuary. So it's actually illegal to fish mantas anywhere in Indonesia now because of this migration showing how mantas were going into these unsafe areas. So mantas are protected across Indonesia now. So that by itself is a huge conservation victory for mantas, getting a country like Indonesia to protect mantas everywhere they are within that country. It's great. But the thing is, we could actually do even more with that. So what we did later that year is after we discovered this, is we actually took the information to the Convention on Migratory Species. And this is actually a multinational convention. Uh, it's a convention supervised by the United Nations Environment Program. And it applies to species considered migratory, ones that travel really great distances where we think they might be crossing international boundaries. So it requires lots of different countries to get together to protect them. So species listed on CMS, uh, the countries need to enact measures to protect them. So if a species is listed on there, it really does a huge amount to ensure their conservation globally. It's a really big victory. And until we found this migration in Indonesia, we didn't think that reef mantas traveled far enough to be listed as migratory. Um, but this migration clearly demonstrated they were traveling those great distances. So it was a huge victory for us. And um, this Indonesia victory with Wallop, it's just one of the first ones. Um, with Manta Matcher, we've actually been discovering migrations all over the place that we didn't know about just from photographs and just from divers sending their photographs into the website. So we've found migrations between Thailand and Burma, um, and we've seen mantas, reef mantas as well, moving between Mozambique and South Africa right here. And this is all just from people taking photos and submitting them to the website. So it's a really fantastic way where it really just goes to show you guys can do something really simple, really easy, and it makes a big difference in terms of our knowledge of mantas and also their protection locally and globally. So just thank you guys for listening to me. I'm going to stop the screen sharing now. And yeah, uh, hopefully, yeah, be able to chat with you guys if you have any questions for me. All right, you're back. Anna, thank you so much. Thank um, you guys. You can hear me okay? Yep, I can. Perfect. So let's introduce our classrooms and we'll, we'll, we'll run through them and give them a chance to ask uh, some questions. So our first group is Mrs. Turner's. They're joining us from Gateshead in the UK, in the United Kingdom. And they're a grade three group. I'm going to turn your microphone on and go on, go on ahead with a question. What subjects do you need to study to be a marine biologist? Did you hear that? Sorry. Uh, you got a little faint at the end, but it was what subjects do you need to study? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so there's a lot of different things. Um, a lot of people just come in with general biology backgrounds, uh, zoology, as well as um, more specifically marine biology. Um, my background is actually a little different from most of the people we work with. I started out studying biology, but actually became more interested in the policy side and sort of the intersection of policy and science. Uh, so. I've done a little bit more management study than most of our other people. Um, rather than straight biology, I've done a lot of policy stuff as well. So, okay, and it's, <laughs> it's going to make this more complicated than theirs. There's a lot to study, basically. Um, and it kind of depends on what specifically you want to get into. You can get into the side where you're changing how CMS does things, and then you're really on the policy side and the protection side or you can be on the straight up research side where you're going out and writing the papers that are taken to CMS. I kind of sit in the middle, so I've kind of done both, um, both the biology, the science, and the humanities, the policy side. All right, good question and a good answer. Um, let's see, joining us next, we have Mrs. Haley's group from Farmington, Missouri. They're a grade eight class. Uh, let me turn your microphone on. 
Did you originally plan on it? Being a marine biologist? Being a marine biologist. Oh. Uh, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no. Um, I've always loved the ocean my entire life. Um, I've always been a really big swimmer and always wanted to spend as much time in or under the water as I possibly could. But it actually wasn't my plan for a long time. I was going to go to law school. That was my plan when I finished um, my university degree. But then I started traveling and became a dive instructor and just decided I really wanted to be more directly involved with the ocean. So I got um, more involved on the marine science side after that. So I've gone back and forth. It changes all the time. All right, our next class joining us is Mrs. Sharp's class in New Liscard in Canada. They're a grade seven, eight class. Let me turn your microphone on. Hi, um, we're all, uh, this is Miss Sharp's class from New Liscard in Canada. We're all around 14 and 15 years old. Uh, no, 13 and 14 years old. And I was wondering, how do you know if it's like false information? Uh, the information uploaded, you mean? Uh huh, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, uh, it's generally pretty obvious. So as you might have seen when I was on there, um, I just went you walked you guys through the sort of easy steps where you just you send me the photo, you tell me when and where it was. You might have noticed if you were looking carefully, there was an advanced information button on there. And then you can tell me which species of manta it was, male, female, age, uh, behavior, and so forth. And that's helpful information. Um, but a lot of people can't do that correctly. So there's two different levels of how we tell whether someone's being honest or not. First thing, most people are honest. I really actually have not encountered many that I would think people are lying with. It just people don't tend to do that or we haven't encountered it at this stage. Um, but usually if we get something where it doesn't look right to me, um, if I'm managing an area, I tend to know when and where the mantas will show up. So if someone tells me that they saw a manta in June at one of my Thailand sites, I'll know that's probably not true because the mantas are not there then. Um, so I might email them and ask if they put in the correct date. Um, some other things I can do is I look at the photo's metadata. Um, when people take a photo, there's information embedded into it with the date. So I can look there as well and see if everything matches up. So that's one of the things I'll do um, to see if someone's just deliberately lying. But that's something that we really just don't encounter. Uh, the other thing is people might unintentionally give me incorrect information. If they fill in the advanced information section, they might tell me it's a female manta when it's actually a juvenile male manta. Sometimes they're hard to tell apart. And that's where the researcher comes in. Before we run the algorithm, we check that. We take a look. We go, did, did they identify the species correctly? Did they sex it correctly? Or if they didn't fill the information in themselves, uh, we can look at the photo usually and fill it in based off the photo they've sent. So there's always a researcher who goes through and checks everything and makes sure everything looks correct to us. All right, great question. Our next group is Ms. Digby's group in Fairfax in the United States. They're a grade 11 class. Uh, let me turn your microphone on. Okay. Um, I was wondering what the most challenging aspect of the job is. The most challenging aspect. Oh, that actually, <laughs> it's actually a really easy one for me right now. Dealing with governments a lot of times in these countries. Um, a lot of the times we're working in developing countries. Um, so some people, they might say conditions are challenging when you're going places where you're staying somewhere really basic and you only get cold showers. But I'm used to that. I've been living in developing countries for like 10 years now. Um, but it's the governments dealing with getting permits and um, getting information from them and trying to collaborate with them. A lot of times we have really great collaborations with the governments, but also it seems sometimes the rules are not terribly consistent. And as a foreigner trying to learn what needs to be done to get permits is very difficult in a lot of cases. Um, and getting consistent information is very difficult. So it's... Um, 
usually making sure you have a good relationship with the government and really communicating with them well. All right, another great question. Um, our next group, let's visit uh, Mrs. Nadon's group in Corner Brook. They're in Canada as well, a grade five, six class. And I'll turn your microphone on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, how long have you been doing this? Uh, how long have you been doing this? So the Manta Research. Uh, well, I started the Manta Research specifically when I started with Marine Megafauna, September 2014. Uh, I'd obviously spent time around mantas when I was working in diving. I was diving with them, but in a completely different role. Um, I'd spent time in research before, um, but studying things that were not mantas, um, maybe tropical forests or also social science side of things as well as related to conservation. So I've been studying mantas for as long as I've been with MMF. All right, and our final group joining us today is Mrs. Templeton's class. They're joining us from Round Rock in Texas, and I believe your microphone's on. Hello, um, we're in Mrs. Templeton's class in fourth grade. Um, what is the most unique pattern of the manta ray? I mean, spot. spot. Oh. Spot patterns. Oh, there's all sorts of different spot patterns. Um, I don't know if I can pick just one. Uh, we've named a lot of our mantas based off what their spot patterns look like. So, for instance, one of the mantas we see in uh, a Myanmar manta, his name is Kiwi, actually, because he has a pattern that looks exactly like New Zealand on his belly. Uh, we also have a manta named Chaplin because he looks he's got like a little Charlie Chaplin hat and a guy with a mustache looks like on his belly So we actually try and name a lot of them to match their spot patterns and That makes it easier for us to remember them and also makes it possible for me to occasionally recognize the manta underwater um, When they've got that really recognizable pattern and name All right, well, Anna, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. It's awesome to learn about the research you're doing uh, in Mozambique as well as in Indonesia. Um, it's, uh, I'm sure there's some more students out there now excited and interested to learn more about mantas, and hopefully in the future they can add some pictures to your database. Yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing some from you guys. All right. And thanks well, for having me, it's been great. Oh, it was great to have you. Um, for those who haven't checked out the Marine uh, Megafauna Foundation, uh, it's a great website. You can find lots of cool pictures and learn about some of the research uh, that they're doing there. All right, so I'm gonna turn the microphones on, let the classes say goodbye and thank you, and we'll sign out for today's Hangout. So microphones coming on if you guys wanna say goodbye and thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Thanks everybody for joining in today and hopefully we'll see you later in the day for some more hangouts.